Why doesn't this work? Yeah, you know that your homework is due this Wednesday, and the lab assignment is due this Friday, right? How, how is everyone doing on the labs? So, so, is there anyone done? <laughs> Only one person? Did you do the extra credit too? Almost. Okay, that should be fun. You can, you can explore different policies. And that's the extra credit. So you can actually explore a lot of things that we will discuss today, if you're interested. Or come up with your own ideas. OK. You may not have realized this, but there is a midterm coming up. It's actually scheduled for April 10th, but that's a very bad week. So uh, we might actually move it to the week after. Is that good for everyone? <laughs> yes? Who would prefer it next week? instead of the week after? <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> Who would prefer not to have the midterm at all? Wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a big fraction. <laughs> well, we'll have to have it. That's how you prepare for the final also, right? That's when is our final date? Is that? The first, Monday. first Monday, yeah, that's right. That's what I remember. Fifth or sixth? One of those, I think. It may be sixth, but fifth. OK. Yeah, we'll have to discuss this. But stay tuned here. Uh, OK, last lecture we covered a lot of caching policies, replacement policy, sector caches, multi-level caching, write policies, unified versus separate instruction and data caching. Looks like this is my picture from the last lecture. That's the unified instruction and data. So you should have a good idea of what are the trade-offs related to these. We've started on virtual memory cache interaction. I'll briefly go over that to jog your memory in that. Uh, and if you really want to, we can go over the uh, question from the exam. So I'll ask you if you want to in a few minutes. Uh, we've covered virtually indexed, virtually tagged, physically indexed, physically tagged, and virtually indexed, physically tagged caches. Remember the virtual physical caches. When do you do the address translation? Before you access the cache or after you access the cache or in parallel? with the cache access. And we figured out that the idea of doing it in parallel is a good idea because it gives you, it overlaps the latency of address translation with the latency of cache access. And if you actually tag the blocks with the physical frame number, then you reduce the problem that happens with the synonyms. You remember the synonym problem? Yes? Two different virtual addresses mapped to the same physical address, right? They're synonyms. And the problem is if you, uh, they could be in different locations in the cache, which means that the same physical address could be in different locations in the cache, which means that if the physical address is updated with one of the virtual addresses, you'll have to update that other location that also stores the physical address, right? Now you have a coherence problem. And we've looked at several solutions to fix that problem. Uh, and we'll get to that, uh, I think, soon. Uh, today we'll wrap up virtual memory cache interaction which I've just briefly discussed. And we'll talk about how to improve cache and memory hierarchy performance, and we'll talk about enabling multiple accesses in parallel. So just to remind you, we've discussed this. I've already told you what the synonym problem is, and they happen because of a lot of software constructs, shared libraries, shared data, copy on write pages uh, within the same process. These all lead to different virtual addresses mapping to the same physical address. And it does create problems uh, if you do this, if you do one of these cache organizations. Basically, access the cache before you do the translation or access the cache in parallel with the translation. If you have a physical cache, this doesn't happen, but this is bad. This, uh, this not a good design because now uh, your address translation is on the critical path of your load, which means that your load latency lengthens. And this was the example of the virtually indexed physically tagged cache. Basically, your index the cache is indexed using the virtual address. And in the meantime, you also, uh, the processor also accesses the TLB. Physical frame number is obtained after TLB access happens. And while, that, while that's happening, the cache is accessed, and you get the tag, and you compare the tag, physical tag, with the physical frame number. Basically, the tag of a cache block is the physical frame number of that cache block. It's a physical address. Now, the problem is some of the index bits that you're using to index the cache are changing during translation, right? Which means that the same 
physical frame number, the same cache block, can exist in multiple locations as determined by those index bits that can potentially change. Okay. And this is, uh, these you can study on your own. Basically, these show in a little bit more detail. This is your virtual page number, and some of the bits uh, of the virtual page number actually determine your index. Okay. So how do, you, how do you solve that problem? This problem is clear to everyone, right? Okay, good. Now that's clear to everyone, how can you solve that problem? Well, basically, you can solve the problem by ensuring that no bits come, uh, no index bits come, uh, come from the virtual page number, right? Which means that your cache size is actually limited to the page offset, your page size, which is very limiting. But you can actually uh, increase your cache size by increasing your associativity. Right? Remember, your index can actually come from here. Uh, there is a byte and block that comes from page offset. You can limit your index such that your index doesn't cross over, to, cross over to virtual page number bits, which means that your index is limited to whatever is remaining in your page offset minus the byte and block bits. Uh, that's, the, that's the size of your cache. If you, if you want to ensure that, you don't have any synonyms in the cache. But you can increase the size of your cache by increasing the size, uh, associativity. Now your cache size is limited to page size times associativity. Now this is a limited solution because in the L1 cache level, you don't want to have your cache very associative, right? That increases your latency as well. So people have developed other solutions, and we've discussed some of those solutions. Uh, or you can rest, uh, and one of these solutions is actually when you write to a cache block uh, in the cache, figure out what other locations can potentially host that cache block in the cache index into that location, figure out if that physical address that you're writing to also exists in that location, and then update that location or invalidate that location. This is a coherence, this is a form of coherence within the cache. Right? So that's one solution. And that solution is actually implemented in some processors. This solution is also implemented some, in some other processors, but this is an easy solution. Alpha 21, 264, uh, I believe they had four possible locations where a physical address can belong to in their L1 cache because they took, uh, actually that could be more than four, but uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, I, b I believe that two bits uh, came from the index, mm, two, two bits of the index came from the virtual page number, and you could potentially have four possible locations where a physical uh, address can be in the cache. And when uh, a write happened to the cache, they actually snooped all those possible locations, maybe basically searched all those possible locations in the cache to ensure that there's coherence within that physical address. And this, uh, the, the third solution is to ensure that you actually take bits uh, for the index from the virtual page number, so you can actually make this index as, lo as large as possible, but to ensure that the operating system doesn't uh, change those bits during the translation. So this is an operating system level solution. Uh, during, page, during address translation, the index uh, bits do not change. That's it. This is called page coloring. Basically, the operating system says, uh, let's say two bits are coming from this uh, virtual page number uh, to get from the index. The operating system says these two bits do not change during the translation, which limits the page placement for the operating system. right? And this is used in many Spark processors, as we've discussed last time. Okay. And uh, I've given you an exercise. If you would like, I, I, I can go over this exercise, or we can uh, go through the rest of the lecture. And the exercise is actually a midterm exam problem. This is a, this is a fun topic to uh, generate problems on. You could actually generate problems on your own. And this is a real problem. That's why all of these solutions are real. Uh, this was from a midterm exam in, from 2009. And it's actually asking you uh, to go through and figure out which bits, uh, which uh, physical addresses can exist in uh, two different locations in the cache. And it's actually asking you the indices of those two different locations in the cache and how to solve the problem. Do you want me to go over this problem? I guess I'll take a vote here. <laughs> Who wants me to cover the problem? One, two, anybody else? Yes, I guess I'll go over it. <laughs> I'll go over it quickly. This is fun. Uh, 
Let's see. I guess I'll do it over here. So you can read the problem while I'm erasing this board. Uh, well, I can read it over here too. Do you guys see that? All right. I guess I'll find it later. So it says we have a byte addressable toy computer that has a physical address space of 512 bytes. The computer uses a simple one level virtual memory system. The page table is always in physical memory. The page size is specified as eight bytes and the virtual address space is two kilobytes. Uh, how many bits of each virtual address is the virtual page number? That's the first uh, question. This is easy, right? So what does it say? Uh, the virtual address space is two kilobytes. If the virtual address space is two kilobytes, then you have 11 bits for the virtual address, right? And it also says the page size specified as eight bytes. Uh, if the page size specifies eight bytes, this is your page offset, right? And eight bytes means it's three bits. You use three bits to specify the page offset. And this is byte addressable. That's, uh, that was given earlier, which means that you need eight bits to specify the virtual page number, right? So this is the virtual page number. So that's the answer to the first question. It's pretty simple. Uh, how many bits of each physical address is the physical frame number? Well, you do the same thing for the physical address. The physical memory size is given, and it's given as 512 bytes, I think, which means that you have nine bits. And again, page offset, well, I didn't do a good job here, but page offset is three bits which means that the remaining six bits is the physical frame number. So you have six bits for the physical frame number. That was also easy, right? Okay, so you can do this really quickly in the exam, on the exam. Next, we would like to add a 128 byte write through cache to enhance the performance of this computer. However, we would like the cache access and address translation to be performed simultaneously. In other words, we would like to index our cache using a virtual address, but do the tag comparison using the physical addresses, virtually indexed, physically tagged, which is what we discussed. The cache we would like to add is direct mapped and has a block size of two bytes. Right. The replacement policy is LRU. Well, this is to throw you off, I guess, right? Direct mapped, replacement policy, LRU. <laughs> that, don't, that don't go well together, right? This is basically a no-op. If you have a direct map, you should know that there is no uh, replacement policy. Answer the following questions. How many bits of a virtual address are used to determine which bytes in a block is accessed? So how do you figure this out? Now you need to fi uh, interpret the cache address, right? So we have a virtually indexed physically tag. Let me draw this over here again. This is our virtual address. Mm. Well, well, let's ignore that. Uh, how many bits of a virtual address are used to determine which byte in a block is accessed? This is saying. Uh, this says that block size is two bytes, right? Which means that the byte in block is one bit. Right? Because you have a two byte block. That's it, that's the answer. <laughs> okay, the next uh, uh, question is how many bits of a virtual address are used to index into the cache? Which bits exactly? That's question, I guess, four, yeah. So we have the information that this is a 128 byte cache, right? And it's direct mapped, and it has two byte blocks. That's enough to answer this question, right? Well, we have other things also, but which means that you have 64 blocks. And since it's direct mapped, you need to have 64 sets which means that your index needs to be log two to the 64, which is six uh, bits, right? Yes. And the answer is six bits, right? How many bits of a virtual address are used to index into the cache? Six bits. And it's really these six bits here. Which bits exactly? Well, it's uh, bit zero is used for byte and block. Bits one through six must be used for the index. Okay, that's also simple. And then how many bits of the virtual page number are used to index into the cache? Now, that, now you know this is, the, uh, this is the, how you index the cache uh, using the virtual address. And this is also the translation part of the virtual address, where virtual page number bits and where page offset bits are. So let's take a look. Let's superimpose these two things together. 
This is the cache point of view of a virtual address. Basically, where, your, where do your index bits and wide and block bits come from? And this is the virtual memory point of view of a virtual address. It's the address translation point of view. It's always good to visualize when you're solving these problems. If you look at this, uh, virtual memory point of view says three bits are for the page offset. And the remaining eight bits are for the virtual page number. And the question asks, how many bits of the virtual page number are used to index into the cache? Well, two bits uh, come from the page offset. And the remaining four bits, these six bits are used to index into the cache. And two of them come from the page offset. Remaining four bits come from the virtual page number. So the answer is four, right? Make sense? So four bits come from the virtual page number. That's uh, question five. Yes. It doesn't ask which bits, but you can figure out which bits, right? It's bits three through six. OK. The next question, what is the, tag, what is the size of the tag store in bits? Show your work. That should be easy, right? That's irrelevant to this discussion. But what is the size of the tag store? You can figure it out from here, right? Well, I guess you will need to figure out what's your tag sizes. So remember, we had 64 blocks, 64 sets, uh, direct mapped, which means there is no replacement policy bit. Uh, what does a tag look like? It's always good to start with that. A tag needs to have a valid bit, right? One bit for valid. What else? Uh, did we say? Uh, we said write through cache. If you look at the top, it says write through. There's no dirty bit. And we need a tag, of course, then. So what is a tag? We said with this is virtually indexed physically tagged which means that physical frame number is your tag. What is the size of the physical frame number? Well, we figured it out here, six bits. So your uh, tag is six bits. So you have a seven bit tag store entry, and you have one tag store entry for each block. So it's 64 times seven. That's the size of the tag store. And that's the answer to that question, which is question six. Looks like I got it right. Yes? Why does the, uh, the actual tag itself only have to be six bits whenever you have a nine bit physical address? So the, the reason is your tag is really your physical frame number. Because these bits are used to index into the cache, right? E either index into the cache or as part of the Biden block. You don't really need these as part of your tag. You could. I mean, there's no reason not to have them. Well, you don't want to have the Biden block, of course, because you could certainly have them, but that would be redundant. OK, now let's move on to the next part, the more fun part. Everything OK so far? This is fun, right? <laughs> OK, next one. OK, this is, suppose we have two processes sharing our toy, toy computer. These processes share some portion of the physical memory, some of the virtual page, dash physical frame mappings of each process are given below. And you can read that. Uh, the first question is, give a complete physical address whose data can exist in two different locations in the cache. Now this is asking you the synonym uh, problem, right? You have one physical address that can exist in two different locations. And how do you find that out? Well, uh, basically, these two different, uh, these two processes should share the same frame. So if you look at that, the only frame that's shared between these two different processes is frame three. And frame three maps to page 15 and page seven. But we're asking for the physical address. So the answer is any location in frame three can potentially go to multiple locations in uh, the cache. So what is an address in frame three? Again, I'll do this. I'll replicate our physical address here, the bottom. Three bits is the page offset. This is a physical frame number. So our physical frame number should be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Because this is six bits, and we want an address in frame three. And any address in frame three would do. So I'll just take the first byte in frame three. 
And this is the address. This address can exist in multiple locations in the cache. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. If your answer is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, that'll also be fine. Right? Any address in frame 3 can go to multiple locations. And then the question asks, give the indices, it says indexes, I guess that, that'll work too, right? <laughs> of those two different locations in the cache. Well, then it's simple, right? Uh, what are the two possible locations uh, in the cache? Basically, this maps to page 15 and page 7, right? Now the question is, uh, mm, where do those uh, indices come from? Remember, we're indexing from here, right? Where's the virtual page number? Maybe I'll do that. It'd be nice if I had the, oh, there it is. So this address can actually come from virtual uh, page 15, process 0. So if you look at the virtual page number, uh, the bottom three bits are actually 0, 0, 0. That's what we decided, right? And virtual page number can be page 15. And remember, we had eight bits here, right? So what is 15? 1, 1, 1, 1. I believe, yes, and 0, 0, 0, 0. That's, that's one of the virtual addresses that map to this physical address. Let's call it virtual address 1. The second one is 0, 0, 0. That's the uh, page offset. And the virtual page number is 7, right? I believe it is true. 1, 1, 1, 0. 0, 0, 0, 0. Now we've got to figure out what are the indices. Well, we know what parts of the virtual page number we used to index into the cache. We said bits 1 through 6, right? That's right. So what are bits 1 through 6? 1 through 6. This is our index. And bits 1 through 6 here are these. And this is the second index. And these are the answers, basically. The first index that this address can reside in is 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. The second index that this address can reside in is 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. Make sense? OK. And one more. There's more. <laughs> we do not want the same physical address stored in two different locations in the 128 byte cache. We can prevent this by increasing the associativity of our virtual index physically tagged cache. What is the minimum associativity required? Basically, uh, you want to get rid of these bits that change during translation, right? How many bits actually change during translation? Well, we figured out that it's four bits, right? If you make your cache 16-way associative, you get rid of those bits. Because then your index actually comes from the page offset. Right? Does that make sense? That's the idea. We make the cache 16-way associative such that uh, the index is actually only two bits. And we don't use the virtual page number to index into the cache. So the answer here is 16. You need an associativity of 16 to ensure that you do not take any bits from the virtual page number to index into the cache, because those were the things that caused the problem, right? OK? OK. And the last one is assume uh, we would like to use a direct map cache. So we don't want to increase the associativity. This is the L1 cache, right? We don't want to make it 16-way. 16-way is a large associativity. Describe a solution that ensures that the same physical address is never stored in two different locations in the 128-byte cache. So we're going to have to deal with these bits that change during translation somehow. Well, one solution, as we discussed, is the operating system ensures that the bottom four bits of the virtual page number is always the same as the bottom four bits of the physical frame number. Basically, the operating system ensures that uh, that mapping is maintained. And that solution is page coloring. Right? That's one solution. So you need to write that. Or another so solution is, uh, when a cache fill happens, 
you go through all possible 15 other locations to figure out whether uh, that address that you're filling into the cache already exists in the cache. Make sense? For example, in this case, let's say we're writing to virtual address 00001111000. And it, happen it, it happens to be present in these two different indices in the cache. Uh, well, uh, your index is this, right? 1111100. And let's say that that physical address is present there. The tag contains zero 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 one one. That's the tag. And it's valid. Let's say we're writing some data here, and the data value we're writing is five. Now the, there are 16 other locations where this address can also uh, be present. So we need to enumerate all of those. We need to uh, take this address, uh, take this index, and go through all of these indices. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, right? Dot, dot, dot. So 16 potential locations can contain this address. And there, uh, the hardware needs to go through all of those 16 possible locations to see if any of those locations have the same tag. And if they do, if one of them does, or if any of them does, then uh, there's a design des decision to be made. You can invalidate that location, or you can update that location with the value that you're writing. So this is a more hardware-intensive solution, of course, right? OK. I've covered this relatively fast, but hopefully you know the basic concepts. Any questions? Now you can solve this question if it comes up. <laughs> OK, solutions are actually online also. Uh, and there are more exercises in past exams related to this problem than any other problem. And I'd encourage you to look at the, uh, some of these. And we've covered pretty much all solutions in this particular question. OK, some questions to ponder related to this. And then we'll move on to cache performance. At what level, at what cache level should we worry about the synonym and homonym problems? Do you worry about this at the L3 cache level? Yes? No? <coughs> or did I cover too fast that you're all <laughs> dumbfounded now? <laughs> no, right? Because this is address translation uh, happens when you get the virtual address from the processor. And you would like to do it as soon as possible. Normally, when you get to L3 or L2 levels, You've already done the translation. I mean, you don't have to necessarily. But if you need to worry about this problem at every single level, it becomes very difficult. Because it limits the size of your cache, right? So normally, this issue happens at the L1 level. And the, uh, that's why we talk about the L1 uh, when we uh, cover the synonym and homonym problems. Another question. What levels of the memory hierarchy does the system software's page mapping algorithms influence? Yes? Going back to the last one, actually, doesn't L1 become slow? Because of this particular solution? Yeah, if you employ a solution like this, yes. But remember that this happens only on a cache fill uh, or, uh, or when you write to a cache block. So you'll need to do this. And this solution is very heavy-handed. Because if you need to actually search for 16 other possible locations when you write to one location, yes, you, ha you need to uh, you have port contention in the L1. You don't want to provide 16 ports just for this purpose. That's very expensive, as we will see later. But yes, this, th this, this is one of the, uh, this is another reason why the, mm, Well, this problem occurs because L1 is so tightly integrated with the processor. Right? You want L1 to be fast. And this is one, another reason why L1 size is limited, right? because you would like to do this translation. But there are other solutions, as we've seen. <laughs> OK, what levels of the memory hierarchy does the system software's page mapping algorithms influence? We've seen that this page mapping algorithm influences the L1 cache. right? It actually influences where data is placed everywhere. Right. I guess I'll, uh, and, uh, and you can actually, 
control where data is placed by using what we've discussed, the page coloring. So page coloring is very general. Basically, page coloring uh, says that you're mapping a potential, uh, you're mapping a virtual address to a physical address, you're restricting that mapping for some purpose. Right? In this case, our purpose was to ensure that you don't have any synonyms in the cache. But there may be other purposes, right? Uh, for example, we'll see this later on, but operating system actually influences where an address maps to in DRAM as well. So you can think of, here I gave you two points of view of the uh, virtual address. Address, uh, virtual address that, that's from an address translation point of view, that's from a cache point of view, but you can also think of it from a DRAM point of view. So if you look at this, this is a virtual address, and it turns into some physical address after translation. DRAM is usually accessed with a physical address uh, because it's physical memory, right? But physical address is broken to different bits. It's, it could be byte in bus, it could be a column in a bank, it could be which bank, it could be which row in that bank, right? And if you look at this, the virtual page number to physical frame number translation here influences the bank bits. By, by changing this mapping, you can change which bank a row goes to and even a column goes to. This is just one example. I know we haven't covered DRAM, but you can imagine uh, how, how that works. Basically, the key is anything that can change uh, the bits that are eventually used by the physical address or by some address to index into a data structure, index into a memory, influences the mapping, the data mapping that you have. And in this case, it's the system software, which means that the operating system can now control uh, or affect uh, which bank a virtual page is mapped to. And this is, again, page coloring. Uh, it could be, again, channels, for example. So if you have uh, a multi-core chip or even a single core chip with multiple memory channels, channel zero, channel one. We will see this in a later lecture. And the physical address, one of the bits in the physical address is used to actually determine where, which channel the address actually resides in. If that bit can be influenced by the operating system's virtual to physical translation mechanisms, then the operating system has control over which channel a memory address belongs to. It can try to allocate pages such that, for example, maybe the load is balanced across channels, right? That could be one policy. If the operating system has no influence, then it cannot do that, right? If actually this channel bit, for example, actually this is a good example. Let, let's, maybe I'll do this. If that channel bit is purely determined by the hardware, well, look at that. then the operating system has no influence, right? This is your virtual address. This is your physical address. Let's make the physical address a little bit smaller. Let's align them. And this is your page offset. This is what the operating system can influence, right? Virtual to physical address translation. Virtual page number, physical frame number. If you take the channel bit from here, then the operating system can say, oh, I'm going to allocate uh, this virtual address to this physical frame number, right? It can set these bits. It can, it can do the mapping such that it can, for example, load balance across these different channels. If the virtual address is zero, it can say, oh, I'm going to allocate a page whose bit 15, let's say, is zero, physical frame that's zero. That way you color the pages. The virtu the virtual addresses that have bit 0 and page 15 go to channel 0. Right. Or you could do something else. You could do any other mapping. But if this channel bit actually comes from the page offset, then the operating system has no control. Right. Does that make sense? OK. OK, we'll see this later on when we uh, cover DRAM. But if the operating system has control, it can perform page coloring to minimize conflicts. So, for example, you can minimize channel conflicts by allocating virtual pages to uh, different channels. 
from potentially different applications. Okay, any questions on this? That's just to give you an idea of uh, how the system software can affect where data is mapped. I guess another example is uh, large caches, right? Uh, if, you, if you have a, a large physical index cache, L3 cache, for example. Uh, uh -huh. let's, let's look at that example too quickly. Well, it looks like there is no lecture that happened after our lecture last time, huh? This is something you, you may want to keep in mind. If you have a multi-core chip, let's say you have core 0 and core 1, and they're sharing a cache. Let's say it's a large L3 cache, and there are some levels in between. It may so happen that uh, you want these cores do not, uh, you want to give separate space to these cores in this cache. Right? Maybe you, want, you may want to say uh, that this core should get uh, three-fourths of the cache, and this core should get one-fourth of the cache. How do you do that? Well, operating system can actually do that if it knows which bits are used to index the cell 3 cache. How can you do that? Well, if you can influence the index, if the operating system can influence the index uh, of uh, the blocks that are allocated to C0 versus core 1, it can say every fourth index can be allocated to core 1. So if you have one, two, three, four, if you think of your cache this way, those indices uh, that are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 can only be allocated to core 0. And those indices that are 1, 1 can only be allocated to core 1. Right. That's again page coloring. How do you do that? Well. Again, if you look at this, you have this virtual page number. You have this page offset. This is your virtual address. And this is the physical address used to index into that cache. And let's assume that some of the index bits, let's say you have two index bits that are coming from the virtual page number, the operating system, whenever it's allocating a page for core 0, it picks pages uh, whose bits, whose physical, it, it picks uh, physical frames whose two bits uh, are 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0. And let's assume that these are bits 14 and 15. And whenever it's allocating a page for core 1, it picks those physical frames that have 1, 1 for these bits. That's the idea. This way, now you can partition your cache by just memory allocation at the operating system level. Does this make sense? Except now, of course, the operating system needs to know which bits are actually used to index your L3 cache. That's the information that needs to be exposed to the system software or the memory allocator. But this can be very powerful, this virtual to physical translation, because it can enable you to map the data to places to achieve different purposes. In this case, the purpose was to partition the cache. Right? This core gets 3 fourths of the cache. This core gets 1 fourth of the cache. And they never interfere with each other, because the operating system ensures that the indices that are used by this core are mutually exclusive from the indices that are used by this core because of this allocation. OK? All right, any questions? I guess let's go to cache performance. As I told you, people are fascinated by caches. And these are some of the examples. Let's take a look at some other examples of how we can improve cache performance. This is, this is actually one way of improving cache performance by ensuring the applications are isolated. But people have tried to uh, improve the miss rate of the cache 
quite a bit or improve the hit rate on the cache. Let's take a look at the relationship between different cache parameters and the cache miss rate. You've probably seen some of this before. All of these, cache size, block size, associativity, cache replacement policy, insertion policy, and promotion policy, all of these affect the miss rate. Cache size is a big lever. Right? Uh, cache size, whenever people talk about cache size, it's really the total data capacity. So for example, when I tell you uh, it's a 128 byte cache in that toy example, it's really the capacity of the data store. Right? We don't normally consider the tag store as part of the capacity of your cache. A one megabyte cache is the data store again. A bigger cache usually can exploit temporal locality better, right? But it's not always better. And usually the curve looks like this. As you increase your cache size, your hit rate increases and at some point saturates. That's not always true. You can have all kinds of curves. Uh, for example, you may have no hit rate for a while and you can have a 100% hit rate after a while. And I'll encourage you to imagine access patterns. And I have one access pattern that I showed you earlier, right? If you're using the LRU policy, and if you have a cyclic reference pattern, and that cyclic reference pattern doesn't fit in your cache, you get 0% hit rate. Right? Imagine your cache has four blocks. Uh, your cache can store four blocks. And your reference pattern is A, B, C, D, E. And cyclic. And if you're actually uh, using the LRU policy, your hit rate, well, actually, let's say you're using the LRU policy, and let's say we vary the cache size. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, and this is our program. If this is our program, your hit rate is 0 until the cache size is 5, right? And once it's 5, it becomes 100%. Because now your working set starts fitting in the cache. So this is a general curve. It's an average curve across many workloads, but there are other workloads that show different behavior. And this is one specific example. So once your working set starts fitting in the cache, then cache doesn't provide any benefit. But too large a cache adversely affects hit and miss latency, right? You know this very well. And access time may degrade critical path. And too small a cache doesn't exploit temporal locality well, and you get a lot of conflict misses, or capacity misses as well. And you guys know the notion of working set. We've discussed this earlier. Basically, the whole set of data, the executing application references within a time interval. You'd like to keep that in the cache. And keep this in mind. Uh, and you could actually fix this problem by changing your replacement policy, right? You could have a random replacement policy. Block size, uh, that's the data associate, uh, is the data that's associated with an address tag. And the size of that actually determines your performance also. But one, one thing that you know now is this is not necessarily the unit of transfer between hierarchies, right? You could actually have sub-blocks. Uh, and a block is divided into multiple pieces in a sub-block or sector cache. But if you, have, if, you look, if you plot the performance with block size, this is what you would get on average. As you increase the block size, the hit rate starts increasing because you exploit spatial locality better. But after a point, your hit rate starts reducing because now you have two large blocks. If you have two large blocks, you can store, well, this is for a given cache size. If you fix the cache size, total data uh, store size. If you have two large blocks, that means you can store a fewer number of blocks in the cache. And maybe if you don't have spatial locality, you're not exploiting your cache well. OK. If you have two small blocks, you don't exploit spatial locality well, and you have larger tag overhead. If you have two large blocks, and you have too few total number of blocks. That's why your hit rate may decrease. And you can, likely, you can transfer data that's likely to be useless, right? If your spatial locality, if you have four kilobyte blocks, for example, if you're not using all of it, you're wasting data which means that you're consuming extra bandwidth and energy. So this is the average curve again, but you can construct a workload that looks, I guess, nicely. Your hit rate keeps increasing as your block size keeps incre increasing, right? It's good to think about uh, these. And if you know your workload really well, you can design a cache that's specific for that workload. OK, large blocks. Uh, 
There, there are several uh, ways uh, designers have tried to mitigate uh, the problems with large blocks. If you have a large block, for example, a 256 byte block, and you want to transfer the 30, 30th word from that block, you would like to transfer that first, right, if, they, if a load requests that. That's called the critical word uh, transfer. Uh, a large cache block can take a long time to fill into the cache. And the idea is to fill the cache line or cache block critical word first. Basically, if a load requests the 30th uh, sub-block within that block, first send that from memory. Then send the remaining part of the block. Uh, so this can enable you to um, enable the processor to make progress, right? It just makes sense. The, of course, this complicates the lower part of the memory hierarchy. Now, you don't uh, say to the memory hierarchy, I want this block, but you also tell the memory hierarchy, I want this block and this word first in it. And that needs to go all the way to the memory controller or the next level in the caches. So a lot of existing designs actually employ critical word first, even though it complicates design because if you get a load, you're really waiting for that critical word, right? You're not waiting for the part of the block that you didn't request. So many existing processors employ this optimization, critical word first. And, and sub-blocking, well, you, we've looked at this, right? The idea is to divide a block into sub-blocks or sectors and associate separate valid bits for each sub-block. And this can reduce the wasted bus bandwidth. Now you can uh, do optimizations. And one optimization we've discussed, this, is, this was actually developed for writes, right? You can write to one sub-block without actually transferring the entire block into the cache. Yes? Um, so why do you ask for a critical word first? Let's say you have a load instruction. Uh, I mean, like, suppose you ask for a critical word first. What's the guarantee that the memory controller scheduler is also going to get you that load first? Oh, I see. So actually, yeah, that may not be the best thing to do for the memory controller. That's right. Uh, because uh, it, your data may be laid out such that you, you can more easily get the earlier word. Uh, but it's not. Uh, Usually that's not a problem. We'll see the memory controllers later on. So it's, it's not a problem because when you request memory controllers are designed for cache block transfers and you, you can actually get the critical word. It does complicate the memory controller. Yes? So just to add to that, modern memory controllers do allow you to fetch a critical word first. That's so it. If you um, specify a column, it would give you a cache block chunk but in a different order. That's right, exactly. <laughs> but it does complicate the memory controller. OK, so when is this next one actually useful? Mm. Now you can imagine if you have a sectored or sub-block cache, you can imagine uh, bringing only the blocks that you, uh, only the sectors that you requested. Right? Maybe you just bring the critical word and not the remaining part of the cache block. Or if you're, if you're bus bandwidth constrained, maybe you actually bring several sub-blocks. OK, so these two. Uh, optimizations are used to reduce the effect of large cache blocks on performance. And there are a lot of trade-offs associated with it. I'm not going uh, over them right now. But they affect uh, the bandwidth as well as the latency uh, observed by the processor. And this is a latency optimization, as you can see. Right? OK, associativity, we've discussed this. I'll go very quickly. But if you have larger associativity, Usually, you get a better hit rate, but at some point, your performance diminishes. And you can come up with access patterns where this is different. Uh, you get a lower miss rate. And larger associativity enables less, vari uh, less variation among programs. If you're designing a general purpose processor, some programs will demand that associativity, and some, demand, some won't. So you get better performance uh, on average with larger associativity. The downside is you get higher hit latency. Right? Smaller associativity is lower cost and lower hit latency. And this is especially important for L1 caches, as we've discussed. I guess one question I like asking is, do you need your associative to be a power of 2? No. Because right. associativity is really a, TAC, a CAM, right? It's a TAC comparator. You don't 
uh, actually take any bits from your address to index or to decide which way. You figure out which way a block resides in by just doing a CAM, a content addressable memory comparison. So your associativity doesn't have to be a power of two. It could be 17, for example. And I believe there was a processor with a 17-way cache. I do not remember what it was. <laughs> Maybe Yungu, Yungu does. <laughs> okay. Okay, we'll get back to associativity because especially for L1 caches, this, this has been a big concern. And researchers have looked at ways of approximating the performance of higher associativity caches with a, with a direct map cache. And we'll see some ways of doing that in a little bit. But let's first classify these cache misses. The cache misses are in general classified into three, compulsory misses, capacity misses, and conflict misses. Compulsory misses are misses that cannot be eliminated with a cache. That's the basic definition. First reference to a block always results in a miss because you haven't seen that block, right? Which means that you couldn't have cached it. Uh, subsequent references should hit unless the cache block is displaced because of these reasons below. And this compulsory miss dominates when locality is poor, right? So if you're never reusing any blocks most of your misses are compulsory misses. Right? And if you do not have spatial locality, and if you're never using anything, then all of your misses are compulsory misses, right? Which means that your caching should not help you. Right? Okay, capacity misses are misses that happen because you do not have enough capacity in your cache. Well, we've seen this, right? Here. We had a fully associated four-way cache that can host four blocks, and but we needed all five blocks in the cache. Well, we had only four blocks, so we got a 0% hit rate. These were capacity misses. Cache is too small to hold everything needed. And these are defined as the misses that would occur even if a fully associative cache with optimal replacement of the same capacity. I guess I didn't think about the optimal replacement here, but that's the idea. Conflict misses defined as any miss that is neither a compulsory nor a capacity miss. So these are harder to... Uh, a little bit harder to think about. Okay, there's actually another kind of miss, which is a coherence or communication miss. We'll add a fourth C here. That happens because uh, you would have cached that block, except some processor wrote to it and invalidated that block in your cache. So if you have a multiprocessor, and if there's sharing of a cache block between different processors, you may not get a miss at all because of these reasons, but if some other processor writes to the cache, then it needs to invalidate your block. Well, that's one way of handling coherence. Right? And when this processor accesses that block, it gets a cache miss because some other processor needed that block. And some other processor needed to do something to that block, right, writing to that block. That's a coherence miss, right? That's not because it was compulsory. That's not because you didn't have capacity. That's not because there was a conflict, but just some other processor needed that block and needed to write to it. That's a coherence or communication miss. That's something else to keep in mind for uh, when we cover coherence. We'll just add it here. Or communication misses. The miss happens because the data is communicated between one processor and the other processor. OK. So how do you actually reduce each mistype? We'll cover the coherence communication misses later on. Compulsory misses you cannot reduce by just caching, right? by definition. You need to prefetch the data. And we may get to cover prefetching, but the basic idea is if the processor can determine the access pattern of the uh, program, it can fetch the data that it thinks the program will need speculatively. For example, a very common prefetcher that's employed in existing processors are, are stream prefetchers or stride prefetchers. The idea is. Uh, this could be, uh, the idea is uh, you, get, you have hardware that determines the access pattern of the processor. This is the, this is the pattern of accesses. This is 
I guess, pattern of addresses that is generated by the processor. And the processor is accessing A, A plus 1, A plus 2, A plus 3, dot, dot, dot. Specialized hardware can detect this relatively easily, right? By just looking at what is the difference between the last two addresses I've seen. And if that difference is always constant, then the specialized hardware can say, oh, the next access the processor will have is probably to A plus 4. So I'd better get that. And in fact, the specialized hardware called the prefetcher, hardware prefetcher, can speculate even more. Can say, oh, this access pattern has been going on for a while. So I'm going to prefetch not only A plus 4, but A plus 5, A plus 6, A plus 7, A plus 8, dot, dot, dot. So that's a stream prefetcher. And stride prefetcher basically detects patterns like this. Let's say the processor is also accessing B, E plus 15, B plus 30, B plus 45, dot, dot, dot. Again, this is predictable, right? In fact, you can design specialized hardware that detects things like this, C, C plus 4, C plus 7, C plus 11. Maybe you can figure out the pattern here. It can be that specialized hardware. C plus 14, C plus 18, and C plus uh, 21, right? So if you look at this, this is the distances are 4, 3, 4, 3, 4, 3, right? And it, some existing processors have hardware that detect this kind of patterns. And you can imagine why this might happen, right? You may be accessing uh, an array uh, and a small node, uh, a small data structure within that array. And you can get these predictable access patterns. Okay, it wasn't my intent to cover prefetching, but that's, that's the idea. Compulsory misses can be eliminated. Even though the processor may never have seen the C plus 18 before, by keeping track of the access pattern and predicting that access pattern and prefetching data, it can bring into the cache or some buffer that address. That way, this miss will not be compulsory anymore. Okay. Conflict misses, well, you need more, yes. That's a good question. Now you have virtual memory interaction with prefetching also. Do you do this prefetching at physical addresses or virtual addresses? That's another design question with prefetching. Many prefetchers operate on uh, virtual addresses if they're at the processor level. Right? But if you could actually place this prefetcher at the lower, uh, higher levels of the hierarchy, let's say L3 cache, L4 cache, memory controller, at that point you don't have access to the physical, virtual address, right? You have access to physical address. So, if the prefetcher is at the processor level, you can access the TLB to do the translation, right? Uh, you can still get a page fault. Then the question is, do you handle that page fault speculatively with the prefetcher? Most processors' answer to that question is no. They normally don't handle page faults. And many processors don't even handle the TLB misses that are caused by prefetcher, prefetchers. But that's a design choice again. You could speculatively handle the page fault, right? Or you could speculatively handle the TLB miss. TLB misses are a lot easier to handle than the page fault, because you don't need to update the operating system structures. OK. Conflict misses, how do you actually eliminate them? Well, you need to make the cache more associative. Uh, or you could try to uh, approximate more associativity without making the cache more associative. And we'll see some techniques for this. Well, some techniques, victim caches, hashing, and perhaps software hints. Uh, software hints that tell you whether or not you should cache a block. That usually helps conflict misses. Right? Remember, uh, in an earlier lecture, we talked about non-temporal loads and stores. The programmer or the compiler can mark a load or store as non-temporal, meaning that this, if the programmer and compiler can predict that, it's not going to be the data that's going to be brought by this load is not going to be reused, then that bit can be set in the load saying that don't bring in the state into the cache. Right? That helps conflict misses. That helps capacity misses also. OK, we'll cover these two solutions after a break soon. Capacity misses, how do you eliminate them? Well, you would like to utilize the cache space better. And those non-temporal non uh, bits can help that also. Basically, ideally, you would like to keep the blocks that will be referenced. 
And one thing we will cover is software can be designed more intelligently such that uh, the working set of a phase fits in the cache, right? Your working set in total may be greater than the cache, but you can restructure your software, your code, such that you operate only on those chunks that fit in your cache at any given time. It's not always possible. But if you can do that, then you get much better performance, right? For one example, if your cache is one megabyte and uh, your data set is four megabytes, you divide your program such that it operates on the first one megabyte first, and then the next one megabyte, and then the next one megabyte, and then the next one megabyte. This is called blocking. And you could actually do this relatively easily with uh, matrices. If you're doing matrix multiplication, for example, you don't have to multiply the entire huge matrix. You can divide it into chunks and multiply those chunks first. That way you get much better cache locality. And we'll see this in a little bit. OK. Uh, Remember, this was the equation, and I gave you the caveats of this equation also, average memory access time. It's not necessarily what we're going to improve, but this uh, gives a good way of understanding how cache optimizations affect different things. This is the average memory access time, hit rate times hit latency, plus miss rate times miss latency. You can make design decisions that affect all of these. Right? And usually, some things are at odds with each other. How do we reduce miss rate? That's what uh, many researchers are focused on. Well, uh, you, you actually, this is actually reducing miss rate, right? The caveat is reducing miss rate can reduce performance if the blocks are more costly to refetch. And we'll see an example, a concrete example of this soon. You can reduce the miss latency or the miss cost. And there are ways of doing that, right? Actually, the whole purpose of a hierarchy, adding more levels at the higher levels reduces the missed latency. Right? That's the goal. And we'll see, uh, we'll see other ways of doing that also. Reducing hit latency is uh, another way of uh, improving performance. right? Uh, and that's usually difficult because it comes, it, 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 once you've decided the size of your cache, it's difficult to reduce hit latency. Right? So I'd like you to think about how you could do this potentially. Okay. I think I'm going to cover a bunch of techniques uh, that go through reducing miss rate. How do you reduce miss rate? And how do you actually reduce miss latency and cost? Well, I think before we start, let's take a break for about five minutes. And let's be back at 1.39. Let's take a look at some of these approaches to improve cache performance. Reducing miss rate, uh, I'm not going to cover more associativity. That's one option. But uh, we're going to cover some alternatives or enhancements to associativity and some better replacement and insertion policies. Uh, we're not going to look into that a lot, but we'll look at some software approaches first. OK, victim cache is one idea that improves associativity. And it's a simple idea. Uh, the idea is, at the L1 level, you don't want any associativity at all, because hit rate, uh, the hit latency is very, very important. As you add associativity, you're increasing the critical path. But uh, if, you don't, if you have a direct map cache, you have a bad ping-ponging problem, right? Uh, which is you cannot tolerate any bad mapping uh, of cache blocks uh, to sets. OK, I guess there. I'll use this one. If you have cache block A and B that happens to map to the same set, and what, you're, what the program is doing is A, B, A, B, A, B. You have a problem. Right? You cannot tolerate this. You'll get 0% hit rate for this behavior. Well, you could say that, oh, I'm going to cache only one of them. I'll, do, I'll not replace one of the blocks. Then you get 50% hit rate, right? We'd like to get 100% hit rate in this case with a direct map cache. And the idea here is if you had a small, fully associated buffer where you put the conflict misses, conflicting blocks, maybe you can tolerate some of that. That's the idea of a victim cache. Victim cache caches the evicted victim blocks. And it's a small buffer, maybe a 32 entry buffer, 32, which can host 32 blocks. And it's fully associative. It doesn't have to be. 
But when it was proposed, it was fully associative. But the idea is to cache or keep uh, blocks that were evicted due to conflict misses recently. Now, when you do a cache access, you first access the direct map cache. If there is a miss, then you access this victim cache. And if the data exists in the victim cache, then you return it back to the processor. Another design choice, you could do this access in parallel. You could start the victim cache access in parallel with the L1 cache, right? That's the idea. And it turns out this is effective. This can avoid ping-ponging of these cache blocks mapped to the same set. Right. The downside is now it's additional complexity, right? You have this other thing here. And it increases the miss latency if it's accessed serially with L2. So a mini processors actually start the L2 access in parallel with the victim cache access. Normally, victim cache access is not in parallel with the direct map cache because that's on your critical path, right? Now, this buffer uh, can be, if you want to get a lot of benefit from this buffer, you do want to make it associative. And you do want to make it reasonably large. Although, uh, researchers have shown that a small victim cache can help you a lot in eliminating these bad cases, eliminating these conflict misses. And that's the paper. I would refer you to if you're interested in reading more about this. Existing processors actually employ victim caches, uh, some existing processors. And this does buy you the benefit of a little bit of associativity without the cost. Without the cost in terms of access latency. Complexity, some of the complexity is still there, right? Because you still need to access this additional buffer. Okay? Does that make sense? Why does this work? Well, it works because. Uh, there's, uh, it works when there are few sets that are contended this way. If you have only, for example, five or six sets where you get such conflict misses, well, you need only a five or six entry victim cache, right? You could solve the same problem by increasing your associativity, but if the problem happens only with five or six sets, there is a simpler solution. Yes? So yeah, the, the management policies now uh, are again designer's choice. If you, uh, this is a, essentially another level of cache, except it's not larger than the next level, right? So normally when you think of the next level, next level is much larger. Here the goal is not to cache more data, but the goal is to tolerate these conflict misses. So it's, it is essentially another level of cache, but it's not in the traditional sense. It's enabling you to tolerate these uh, conflict misses by caching a few of those. And the policies, when you, when you actually miss in the direct map cache and hit it in victim cache, do you actually bring the data into the direct map cache? You could. But well, you don't have to necessarily. But wouldn't that uh, accessing the victim cache be a little, have a little more latency than accessing the first time? Absolutely, yes. That's right. So, so if you are going to access the victim cache, That's right, yeah. There's additional latency, but the latency is not as bad as the next level cache. That's the whole. Yes? So you could also access both the hard drive and cache. That's right, yes. Uh, victim cache and the direct map cache. That's right. You could start the access of both at the same time. But this may return data earlier, right? The direct map cache. So there will still be additional latency in accessing things in the victim cache. And there are all kinds of policies that you can optimize. There is no single answer. The idea, but the idea, the high level idea is you would like to uh, tolerate these conflict misses better by having a small buffer that buffers those conflict misses. Management policies, now you, that's the designer's choice. Okay, another way of, uh, so this achieves the benefit of a more associative cache without the uh, latency of a more associative cache. How else can you achieve this? Or how else can you try to improve associativity, if, get the benefits of associativity? One idea that we've briefly discussed is hashing. So instead of uh, having your index function directly come from your address bits, so conflicts happen because the indices of two different blocks are the same, right? This is the index. 
And it may so happen that the program is accessing blocks that are at the same index. Well, how can you solve this problem? Well, what if you randomize your index, right? Maybe a, a hash function, let's say. You take your index bits and you hash them. And the hope is that this better distributes the index, uh, distributes the addresses to different sets. That's the idea. Simple, right? And you could even use other uh, bits of the address to randomize. Well, why, does, why, why could this help? Uh, for example, if you're, uh, cash, if you're striding through your cache, your, uh, it may so happen that your stride, uh, let's say this is six bits here, uh, that's your Biden block, and your stride is 64. Uh, well, I guess I, uh, so it may so happen that, uh, I guess 64 is not a good example, right? You're always utilizing your index zero, right? In the worst case, if your stride is the, size, the same size of your cache, you're, you're always utilizing only one location in your cache. In this case, your stride is equal to your cache size. Basically, uh, you're accessing address A, and then address A plus 64 kilobytes, and then address A plus 128 kilobytes. Assuming that your cache is 64 kilobytes, the cache blocks you're accessing are actually mapping always to one set in your cache. That's the bad thing about using the index bits. If you randomize the index bits now, you can actually store many cache blocks in your cache instead of storing only one cache block. This is the worst case. Okay. So this can reduce conflict misses by distributing the access memory blocks more evenly to the sets. Well, I guess I've given you that. <laughs> it's more complex to implement. Why? Because now you need to have this hash function. And people have looked at many different hash functions. And I've given you one paper that uh, uh, treats the problem theoretically. Bob Rao's paper on pseudo-randomly interleaved memory. It's not the same problem, but the idea is the same. You use a hashing function to reduce conflicts. I believe this is ISCA 1991. And this solution is employed at many different levels. So if you have bank conflicts, again, you instead of using the bank bits directly from the address, you take the bank bits and you use a hash function to distribute the bank bits uh, to physical banks. Okay. Pseudo-associativity is another uh, solution. This is also called poor man's associative cache. Uh, if you actually don't, cannot afford associativity, uh, so associativity, if you think of associativity, you're searching multiple locations in parallel. In pseudo-associativity, you can search multiple locations in serial. The idea is you do a serial lookup. You look up a location in the cache, if there's a miss, you use a different index function to access the cache again. It's like a hash table, right? You rehash to access. So for example, you have a direct map array with k cache blocks. You can implement k divided by n sets. And you can sequentially look up different addresses to see if the location is present. So what might happen is, mm, you can, you can say this is the direct mapped array, and this is your memory, and your blocks may be present, let's say, in uh, four possible locations in the cache. You're, you're, we're going to emulate four-way associativity. A given block in memory can be present in here, in here, in here, and here in the cache. And those are distinguished by the top bits of the index, 0, 0, dot, dot, dot. 0, 1, dot, 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 1, 0, dot, 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 1, 1, dot, dot, dot. We're searching for block A. We first look up 0, 0. Is block A there? If the block A is, not, is there, that's a cache hit. If it's not there, then we change the index to 0, 1, dot, dot, dot. Is block A there? If it's there, it's a hit. If it's not there, the next access. We change the index to 1, 0, and so on. So instead of looking up the ways serially uh, in parallel, 
as an associated cache would do, we're really looking up the ways serially, right? Make sense? Now the downside is now your access latency increases, right? You'd, you'd really like to get the hit uh, in the first access. But you can tolerate conflict misses. The upside is you get better hit rate. Because now if you have multiple blocks mapping to the same index, one of them can go here, one of them can go here, one of them can go here, one of them can go here. You can host them in different places. But the lookup latency is higher. So it's not, uh, it doesn't have all of the benefits of uh, associativity. It's pseudo-associative. Okay, it's fun. <laughs> and people actually designed caches that way a long time ago, like decades ago. <laughs> okay, another uh, idea which is also a cool idea is skewed associative caches. Again, you're trying to, we're trying to minimize the conflicts that we have in a cache without increasing the associativity. How do you do that? Well, the idea is to get rid of these bad cases where things conflict. Make the mapping functions a little bit more flexible. That's what hashing achieves. But hashing maybe a, uh, hashing uh, has its downsides. Let's say you have a two-way associative cache. This is what uh, your cache looks like, you take the index, and you have the same index function for each way, right? The idea of skewed associativity is you skew this function. You have one index function for one way and another index function for the other way. This way you reduce which blocks conflict with each other in the cache, right? You change which blocks conflict with each other in the cache. Now indices are randomized. It's another way of randomizing the index, right? Less likely that two blocks will have the same index. And this way, you may be able to reduce the associativity. Now, the downside, of course, is additional latency of hash function. This is very similar to having all addresses go through the hash, same hash function, but you're doing it differently for different ways. In fact, it's more flexible than uh, this particular hashing that I described earlier. Because that enables uh, more randomization in your cache. OK, and this paper describes uh, that idea. Let's take a look at some other uh, ways of improving cache performance. Restructuring data layout uh, that I briefly talked about. Uh, so for example, if you have a column major array, uh, then uh, the xi plus one comma j follows xij in memory, whereas the other way around, xi comma j plus one is far away from xij. So if you have this code, this is poor, right? Now what you're doing is you're accessing uh, a column major uh, array in a row major order. Right? So if you restructure your code such that you do the loop interchange, you go through your uh, rows first and then column next instead of your column first and row, rows next, you get much better cache locality, much better spatial locality. And this, uh, this, is, a, this is an optimization called loop interchange. You're really interchanging which index you traverse first in your loop. And other optimizations can also increase hit rate. Uh, I'm, I'm going through this relatively fast because this is kind of uh, easy to understand for you, hopefully. We've seen this. You've actually uh, had an exam problem similar to this, right? In fact, it's the same thing, right? In the exam problem, we've, we've asked you, what is, what is a page fault that you get because of this, uh, be because uh, of the layout? of the matrices and uh, once you have code that's similar to this. It's the same thing. You can change uh, the way you traverse your arrays such that you get better hit, hit rate in the cache. And you can imagine other uh, ways of fusing loops. So if you're traversing uh, one array once, uh, so let's say you're doing two operations on an array. You do something on array A, and then there's something else that you do on array A again. Now it may be that uh, if you, you can merge these two loops to improve locality. Right? If you actually mm, have this loop, at the end of this, you don't have uh, the earlier elements of the array in your cache. And then when you do this loop, you get cache misses all over. Whereas if you merge these two loops, if you fuse these two loops, if you've done these operations first, 
And then these operations right after, when you have AI in the cache, you get much better cache locality. So that's the idea of loop fusion. Again, I'm not going to detail, but compilers do a lot of these optimizations to uh, optimize for cache locality. Okay, there are, there are issues, of course. What if you have multiple arrays? What if you don't know the array size at compile time? These uh, make uh, it diff difficult to improve hit rate via software. So if you're actually a good programmer, you can optimize your code such that you maximize this locality, if you can figure out. So another example. Uh, here, I have a node uh, which points to the next node and a key uh, that, uh, to search the node. And perhaps uh, this is a record uh, of students and their schools, right? And we're searching for uh, a particular key. I don't know, maybe grade, grade in 447. I don't know. <laughs> or age. Uh, and this is uh, a linked list traversal. And assume a huge linked list, 1 million students and unique keys. Basically, they we're traversing this linked list and we're checking if every if, if the node that we're visiting has the input key. If that's the case, then we access the other fields of the node. Otherwise, we go to the next location. That's basically a very simple linked list traversal. Try and turn it out, when you run this code, you have poor cache hit rate. Anybody can guess why? If you look at the node structure, would that give you some hint? You basically, Mm. No, nope. I guess I'll have to erase something here. That's our node one. And you have a pointer to node two, you have a pointer to node three. And we're searching for one of the nodes in the linked list. And the input is a key. If the key matches, then we're going to use the data in the node. If the key doesn't match, we're going to move to the next node. I have a million of these. And you get a bad hit, uh, you get a uh, poor cache hit rate if you structure your data this way. Why is that? Yes, you can arbitrate. <laughs> Looks like you're, you're yielded too. <laughs> Why is that? Because your next node can be allocated anywhere in memory independent of the last node. Okay. So I mean, when you load in the cache, you aren't automatically knowing to load in the next node as well. So I see. So that, that, that could be one thing, actually. That's true. That wasn't what I had in mind. But if you, by allocating these nodes such that they're close by each other, you can get better cache hit rate. Because when you fetch this node, uh, you're actually fetching part of the next node as well. Let's assume, uh, why, why is that not guaranteed in this code? You're right, actually. Because you're allocating the next node independently. Let's assume that we're, we've allocated them nicely. <laughs> yes? The size of each node is just huge compared to the size of the cache. Like that's right, yes. That's right. If you, even if you do what you suggest, this won't work because the size of each node is huge, right? Compared to what is normally the size of your cache line. So if you look at the size of the node, it's 256 plus 256, 512 bytes plus some extra, maybe 520 bytes, let's say. Even if you've allocated them nicely, you won't get any locality because, well, <laughs> this node occupies multiple cache lines, right? So the, re the problem is this other fields, these things, occupy most of the cache line even though they're rarely accessed. What you can do is you can restructure your code such that you have two types of node, the node itself and the node data. Right? You can separate the frequently used fields of a data structure and pack them into a separate data structure. That's the idea. And you know which ones will be frequently used, right? It's very likely that you're going to access the data of every node. That's not going to be frequently used. But it's very likely that whenever you do a search on a data structure, you're going to access the next node pointer and certainly the key. So why not take these frequently accessed portions of the node, separate them into a separate data structure, and have a pointer from the node itself and to the data. Now this data structure can be, data can be allocated anywhere. And if you've nicely 
pack together your nodes, you get better cash locality, right? Uh, uh, these nodes. That's the idea. Now the question is, we should do this, right? Yes. Oh, that's a good question. They, they won't be loaded, but they will occupy part of the cache block. So not all of them will be loaded. Let's say you have a 64-byte cache block. You would load, let's say this is a 4-byte node pointer, 4-byte key. That's 8 bytes. The remaining 56 bytes will be part of the name, and they will be loaded. Cache block now contains no key and part of the name. No, if you if you packed your nodes, so if you have if you have a data structure that's nicely packed with your pointers that are close to each other, that won't happen here, right? So you're saying there's a better chance of having the next exactly in the cache in the same cache line. Whereas here, you have no chance, right? If you look at this, you can only host one node pointer and key in a one cache line. There's no other way. Okay? Okay. So the question is who should do this? Basically, the idea is pack frequently accessed data into a single cache line and remove non frequently accessed data from, uh, from frequently accessed data. That's the general idea. This is one example of doing that. Who should do this? Should it be the programmer? Should it be the compiler? Should it profile? Should it be the hardware? In fact, there have been proposals for all of these. Pro programmers certainly can do that today, right? And compilers try to do this also. It's a lot harder in hardware to do this. How do you figure out what's frequently accessed and what's not frequently accessed and pack them together? Although there have been proposals for this. Anyway, we can. Mm. And you can imagine uh, everything we've covered so far in the course talked about static versus dynamic, right? Who can determine this much better? Right. Programmer may think that something is frequently accessed, but it may turn out to be not frequently accessed. Although if you know your use case really well, perhaps you can uh, do this at, uh, best at the programmer level. And certainly the restructuring of the code is done a lot more easily at the programmer and the compiler level. At the hardware level, you don't want to restructure your code. You can restructure what data is stored in the cache. And that, that incurs overhead, too. OK. You can ponder about this. This is a, this is a fascinating area also. Uh, and certainly, it has a lot of impact on performance. OK, but I've talked uh, about blocking. And blocking is another way of improving hit rates. The idea is divide the working set of a program into, a, into chunks that can fit into the cache. That's the basic idea. That's another way of saying that. You can divide the loops operating on arrays into computation chunks so that each chunk can hold its data in the cache. The reason it's uh, formulated as arrays here is because this is much more effective with arrays. It's a lot harder to do with irregular accesses. So this avoids cache conflicts between different chunks of computation. Right? You operate on one chunk of data first, finish what you do, you operate on the next chunk. Next. Uh, and one, uh, the, the, the nicest example for this is when you have matrix operations, right? If you're multiplying two matrices, for example, uh, instead of uh, doing this, when you multiply, uh, what you do is you multiply one row, take one row and one column of the uh, respective matrices and do a dot product, right? Instead of doing this for the entire row and the entire column, entire length of the column, uh, you do that for portions of the row and portions of the col column. Basically, the idea is you multiply, you divide the matrices into sub-matrices or blocks, sub-blocks, and you do the multiplication of this and this first, and maybe this and this next. And maybe this and this next. And maybe this and this next. Now you preserve locality, right? This always stays in the cache. And then you go into this chunk. And then you go into this chunk. And then you go into this chunk. 
That way, you keep stuff in the cache. And you size, the, size these blocks. This is called a block of a matrix, such that the operations that you're doing, uh, uh, such that the locality in the cache is maximized. OK? This is very commonly uh, employed also. In fact, compilers can employ this if they can analyze the size of the matrices and if they know the cache size. Of course, these things become difficult if there are conflicts within a block, if your access patterns are such that you access other things as well. And if you actually have conflicts, this is, matrix multiplication is a nice example because you know the access pattern, right? You can predict that very well. But what if you're doing more sophisticated operations that lead to a lot of conflicts? That becomes difficult to analyze. And array size may not be uh, known at compile or programming time. Then it becomes difficult to optimize also. And you may be running other applications at the same time, right? That's one of the reasons why you may want to partition the caches. If you're running another application that's totally different from matrix multiplication, and if you're doing this optimization, assuming a cache size, well, you'd better guarantee that cache size if you want that optimization to be effective, right? And that's where partitioning a shared cache is useful. OK? OK. Let's move on to some other optimizations. Uh, let's start with, I guess, reducing. How do you reduce missed latency and cost? Multi-level caches, critical word first, sub-blocking, or sectoring, we've talked about this. But we could also have better replacement and insertion policies. And uh, we've talked about this. Each, not all misses have the same cost. And the reason, one reason is memory level parallelism. Uh, this is the idea of generating and servicing multiple memory access in parallel. If you look at this, this miss itself is isolated, right? Its latency is not overlapped with any other miss. So the idea is this is more costly for performance, whereas these two misses are serviced in parallel. And there are several techniques that are used to improve this memory level parallelism. Uh, out of order execution is one, right? The out of order execution is all about latency tolerance. If you get a cache miss, you'd like to tolerate this latency by generating an independent cache miss. And this is one way of generating that independent cache miss by executing ahead. We'll see another way later on in lectures called run ahead execution. Another way is prefetching. And it turns out this memory level parallelism varies. Some misses are always isolated, some misses are parallel. How does this affect cache replacement? Let's take a look at that. Uh, so traditional replacement policies try to reduce miscount, and we've seen that. Uh, an implicit assumption is that reducing miscount reduces memory-related stall time. And I've already told you that this is not true, right? I mean, you actually, you've given me several reasons why this is not true. I'll give you one other reason here. Uh, misses with varying cost or memory level parallelism break, breaks this assumption, actually. Eliminating an isolated miss helps performance much more than eliminating a parallel miss. So if you look here, if you got rid of this miss, you've improved performance for sure, right? Whereas if you got rid of B, well, you haven't really improved performance because the processor would be stalling for C. So the question is, how do you actually do this? You'd like to eliminate these misses that are a lot more costly in terms of performance. So I'll give you one example. I won't give you solutions, but this is just to show you an example that an optimal replacement policy should really be optimized for uh, execution time rather than miss rate. So this is one example. This is, again, a toy example. Your cache can hold four blocks. And misses to blocks P1, P2, P3, P4 can be parallel. They can be generated in parallel because we have out-of-order execution that can parallelize them. Right? Whereas misses to blocks S1, S2, and S3 are isolated. You, even if you do out-of-order execution, there's no other miss that you have in the program. And let's say you have a loop that keeps iterating, keeps doing this. And you have a cache that's uh, of the size of four blocks. It can hold four blocks. We're going to examine two replacement algorithms. One is the Bellady's optimal replacement algorithm, which minimizes the miscount. And the other uh, is a more memory level parallelism aware algorithm, which I'll not describe to you how it operates, but I'll let you read it. And we're going to analyze this for a fully associative cache containing four blocks. So let's see how that works. Uh, if we have this loop, at the steady state, uh, if you have Beldi's optimal replacement, you would keep these blocks in the cache. Right? 
and I'll let you figure out on your own. But the idea is P1, P2, P3, P4 will all hit in the cache at this point in time. And if you use Beldi's optimal replacement at this point in time in the cache, you have P4, P3, P2, P1. And once you've accessed this, uh, this is what will happen. When you access S1, Beldi's optimal replacement doesn't uh, removes the element that's going to be accessed the furthest into the future. And what is that one? That's P1, right? Because if you look at this, this is your loop. You're accessing S1. The block that's going to be accessed furthest into the future is really P1, because you're going to touch S2, S3. Uh, well, in the cache, you're going to touch P4, P3, P2 before you access P1. Next, the block uh, that you're bringing to the cache is S2. The block that you're going to access furthest into the future is, well, S1, right? Because you're going to access P4, P3, P2. So S1 is replaced. So we get a miss here. And then next, you need to replace S2 because that's going to be the one block that's going to ac be accessed furthest into the future. Right? And at this point, your cache state, cache has P4, P3, P2, and S3 in the cache. And when you get to this point, you'll get three hits and one miss. Right? And if you look at the execution profile of this optimal replacement, this is what you get. The processor computes for a while and stalls for these misses. And we're going to lump that stall for once because they're going to be serviced in parallel. And stalls once again for these misses. Uh, well, I guess this is, this is a little bit out of sync here. It actually hits for these and then stalls for the serial miss and then stalls for the serial miss and then stalls for this miss again. So you get four misses and four stalls, right? Why do you get four misses? You miss on block P1, as I've showed you before. And you miss on these serial misses because the distance, reuse distance of these misses are very far from each other. Right? And remember, Beldi's optimal replaces the block that's going to be reused furthest into the future. And basically, you can think of computing the reuse distance at any given point in time of a cache block and you're going to keep in the cache the block that has the, uh, you're going to evict the block that's going to have the highest reuse distance, distance in terms of the number of misses. So if you do optimal replacements, this is what you get. Four misses, four stalls. Why four stalls? Because, uh, well, you have all those misses are actually serial misses in this case. Now let's say uh, we want to be more aware of the memory level parallelism. We have, let's say it, it, if you look at this loop, it always, happens, uh, it, it always happens so that P4, P3, P2, P1 are accessed together. You can service them in parallel. So these are less costly in terms of performance, whereas these S1, S2, and S3 are much more costly. Right? If you eliminate one of these, you eliminate a stall. So we're going to try to keep in cache these blocks. And that's the idea. We keep in cache S1, S2, S3. Now you get hits on S1, S2, S3. You keep in cache S1, S2, S3 and replace P4. But you get misses on uh, P3, P2, P1 when you get here. Right? So you get three misses and one hit. And here, uh, well, once, let's assume that the last thing that remains in the cache is P1 here. We get, again, three misses here. So if you look at this, we got one, two, three, four, five, six misses. But we get only two stalls. So we've increased the miss count by actually 50%, which is pretty high. But we reduced the execution time. Why? Because these misses were a lot more costly in terms of performance. Even though they had, every miss had the same latency, the overlapping of the misses was very different. Here you could overlap the latency of these misses. Here you could not. So why not keep in the cache those misses that you cannot overlap the latencies of. That's the idea of memory level parallelism of a cache replacement, or that's the motivation for it. And I'll let you read uh, how, uh, how to do that. How do you incorporate this factor into replacement decisions? And I, uh, you, can, you can imagine the processor keeping track of uh, the cost of each block, right? And that's the idea. Whenever you bring in a cache block, 
see how many other blocks were serviced in parallel with that cache block and store that with some accuracy in the cache. That gives you an idea of whether this miss was serial or parallel. And when you're replacing, replace the block that was not brought in with many other blocks. OK, so I'll make this a reading for this week since we haven't read a lot uh, so far. But take a look at it. And I think I'll stop here uh, unless there are any questions. OK. So this reading will be posted, and you can, it was actually posted earlier. I've uh, referred to this paper before, but hopefully you'll see a lot of ideas in this paper that improve cache performance. And this will give you a good idea of what cache, uh, what, is the, what is the state of the art in caching looks like today.